Okay, we are live. I just want to say, <laughs> how you guys doing, Growth Nation? I have a very special guest with us today. Her name is Gina Vazzetti. She's a motivational speaker. So, Cookie, can you please just give a brief interview about yourself? First of all, thank you for even for even sharing this opportunity with your oh, book and course. things like that. <laughs> thank you, Terrell. I'm so excited thank about you. it. Thank you. So, can you so, just yeah. give us a brief? Yeah. I do motivational speaking. About three years ago, I started what I like to call this motivational career. I was actually very sick, and I was bedridden for around two years. And basically, I couldn't really go out with my friends. I couldn't really go to school too often and things like that. So I decided I had to do something productive and something that I was really passionate about, and that is dyslexia. I have a learning disability. And for those of you who don't know what dyslexia is, it is a learning disability that affects a person's memory, their comprehension, and their ability to learn. And so I've always suffered with the emotional component of dyslexia, and it's something that I got bullied for growing up, and I just wanted to shine some light on the condition and really raise awareness about it. So I wrote a book called A Shoutout for Dyslexics, The Emotional Side. And then from there I began to give motivational speeches to different schools, hospitals, and organizations. And then now I also host a TV show. So, so many things have been going on the past couple of years. <laughs> That's good. Now, it's funny because everybody always talk. you always hear, the, you know, dyslexia, but nobody really knows what it is. So, could you just go in detail what dysle dyslexia really is? Yes. It is a learning disability that affects the person's memory, their comprehension, and the way that they learn. And so, mm -hmm. with dyslexia, a lot of people are under the impression that people just simply read backwards or they mix their P's with their Q's. But that is just, there's so much more to dyslexia than that. And so it also affects people in their relationships, in their social life. It affected me on the basketball court. It affects everything. And once people can acknowledge that, I do think a word, the word learning disability or that term or that label will get a lot more respect than it actually does. Wow, okay. That's crazy. Okay, so I have a few questions. So talk, first, introduce the book. What, what motivated you to write to, to write the book, first of all. Okay. Well, for writing books, so my biggest insecurities growing up were the way that I spoke and the way that I wrote. So I've always been very insecure. Do I sound articulate enough? Am I intelligent? Because growing up, so many people called me stupid. They called me lazy. Wow. I asked so many questions. And to this day, I'm still very insecure by the way I talk. And I'm really glad to own that and just to honor that fear of mine because insecurities like for this whole motivational field so many people are very black or white they say you know overcome your insecurities or yeah. you don't have to be sad anymore but life is not that easy it's so much more complex than that and so for me I was very insecure by the way I spoke so that's why I give motivational speeches all the time and by the way I wrote I would be fearful in class when the teacher said oh you know peer edit each other's papers or something like that because I didn't want to be laughed at and so I really wanted to face my two insecurities and just shine light on something that I'm really passionate about. Mm -hmm. That sounds good. So now, what does chapter one really talk about? Because I didn't, I don't have the book, so I don't know what it really talks about. But what's like the, you know, the foundation or the basics of chapter one? Oh, great question. So chapter one is called Unlovable, and mm -hmm. it's a a pretty profound and very emotional title because my grandmother, who I call Noni, she's also dyslexic, and oh. Yeah, she grew up in the 1930s, so times were a lot different back then. And mm -hmm. for her, her mom at a very young age told her that she was unlovable. And because of her, it wasn't called dyslexia back then, but because of yeah. you know how slow it took her to understand things and things like that. And so she said, you better pray to God that you find somebody who loves you because no one's ever going to love you. You're a very difficult child. You're going to be very hard to live with. And so mm -hmm. I talk about that as the opening chapter because it really sets a really great foundation for this emotional book and I talk about stories from my aunt's story who's also dyslexic and then to my story which in chapter three is called Smart Water and I don't know if you want me to go into that Terrell at all? Uh, please, yes, please. Okay, so Smart Water basically when I was in my junior year of high school I played basketball my whole entire life and I was very good at shooting, at dribbling, I love the sport but the one thing that I had against me was understanding the plays and the order of things. And yeah. so 
my coach called me out of the game one day, and he blew, had the referee blow his whistle, and I went back to the bench, and I get my water bottle, I'm drinking it, and I'm so tired. He goes, Gina, what is this water bottle? Why are you drinking it? I'm like, I'm thirsty. I need a drink. And then he goes, no, no, Gina, the bottle says Smart Water on it, because ironically at that time it was a Smart Water brand. Yeah. And I'm thinking, okay. And he goes, but you're not smart, so either keep drinking it or get wow. rid of it. Wow. 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 Yeah. Wow. And so then he hit me on the head with it multiple times, and it was in front of my whole team, in front of you know my other coach and everyone who was in the stand. So it was very devastating, and that kind of just followed me throughout my life. Mm. And did, and how long did it take for you to really get over that? Because I know some people who who play basketball, like some a lot of my friends, you know. And that's, that's almost like, you know, where I grew up, that's how coaches treated players, period. I seen coaches, you know, him up, like, grab people by the collar and, and you know, yell in their face. Dur now, this is during the game. I'm not even talking about practice. Right? So you, you experienced the same thing. But, like, just, how, did, how long did it take you to get over that due to the fact that you have dyslexia? How did that affect, like, did that affect you in a real bad negative way? Or how, just talk about that a little bit. Well, that was really a, a changing moment for me from then on. I told myself I would never let myself get disrespected again. And, of course, I don't mm -hmm. always have control over that, but respect yeah. is means so much to me. And I think mm -hmm. nobody should be disrespected like that. You know, I was yeah. very – I was humiliated. And to this day, like I said, I'm still very insecure, and I'm going to have those moments where somebody says something and I get very uneasy and I shut down because I do feel that disrespect card. But I'm, I've forgiven the coach who said those things. I've definitely forgiven – the teacher who told me not to take his class anymore because I'm very slow and I'll slow the class down. And I've just wow. forgiven any of those insults. And now it's mm -hmm. more I want to use it to really empower people and just to share my story so I can motivate people who are struggling like myself. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool. That sounds good. Now, talk about some of the challenges that dyslexics face. Because, you know, a lot of us, we don't really, you know, know what you like what dyslexics go through. So, I don't know if you, you can piggyback on a, on a book, too. I'm sure you touch on that topic in the book, but just talk about that a little bit. Well, I'll give you one that's pretty difficult. is sarcasm. <laughs> you know, I do not understand jokes very well because oh. <laughs> I'm just reading someone's body language. Yeah. And um, just uh, I always want to laugh at people's jokes, and I want to help them out, but so often I'm just like, <laughs> I don't get it. You know, I can't help you there. <laughs> 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 That's funny. That is really funny. So, let me see, because I wrote a whole bunch of questions down just in case I forget. But um, we talked about Chapter 1. Now, how old were you when you found out that you were dyslexic? I was seven. Seven, okay. And how did you feel when you found when they told you that? When I found out I was dyslexic, I had no idea what it was. And mm -hmm. everybody was freaking out. The teacher was like, she's dyslexic. She has a learning disability, or I heard she has a handicap, and I heard all these different terms, and, you know, I'm in the third grade. I really did not know what they were saying, and so I just kind of, I knew I was different. Yeah. I think maybe two other people in the class had some kind of learning disability, but I did not think it was that big of a deal, and it was kind of comforting knowing that I had something, just because yeah. if I just thought I was different, I don't know, it would just be very difficult for me to deal with, but I really didn't understand what dyslexia was until going to college, surprisingly. Wow. Wow. So, wow. So, how, so high school now, because you talked about that you got bullied and stuff. And, and you know, I used to get bullied too because I was short and I had a big head. So, I, I kind of yeah. know what, what you're going through in a, in a way. So, just talk about, like, was high school very stressful for you? Like, did it affect, like, your study habits or did it affect your grades? Like, talk about that. Yeah, so basketball, I did basketball, I ran Tra track and cross country. So it was really the sports that motivated me to do well in school because if you don't make the grades or the, the yeah. GPA, then you, you can't play. Yeah. But I actually, I talk about in Chapter 4 of my book, the quiet mm -hmm. versus the rebellious role that dyslexics often play. Mm -hmm. So throughout high school, I play that very rebellious role, saying yeah. things like, oh, I don't care about school, or I failed the test because I didn't study. But really, that's all I was doing was studying. Yeah. So... Whereas the quiet dyslexic is somebody who doesn't want to be seen. She sits in the back of the room and just mm -hmm. tries to get her way through school without being noticed. Mm -hmm. Now, like, as far as, like, in the classroom with teachers, now, if they don't know that, that you're dyslexic, 
Like, did that uh, come? In, did that come into play any way on how, like, I don't know, like, if you got a bad grade on a test or if you answered a question, like, how did, did were there any like challenges regarding that? Well, I made sure I told every single teacher that I had that I am dyslexic, and mm -hmm. some people respected that, saying, "Oh, great, what kind of accommodations can I provide you?" Or yeah. else, other ones were just saying, "Okay, so is that your excuse? That's why you're not doing well in school." And wow. so it really, yeah, it just depended <laughs> the different reactions, but. I went to a really great high school, so I'm actually really lucky. I went to Mercy High School in San Francisco, and they were very accommodating. But mm -hmm. I just think it's it's hard to own that you do have a learning disability, that you learn differently, that yeah. I also have auditory processing disorder. So mm -hmm. it's it's difficult, and it's a lot to unpack there, it's to explain to a teacher or to explain to somebody that you're dating or to your best friend. And so in the book, I talk about a lot of those tips and how people can go about doing that. Wow, wow. Okay, now, now this is now this is crazy. Now, what about the workplace? Because <laughs> I know that you know I, I I'm sure that there's problems that come into work. But I I don't know what like type of job. That, I don't know if you like where you're working at or anything like that. But I'm sure there are many challenges that come in the workplace, especially if this, if something come in classroom. If you're working on a group project, you know, maybe, what if they don't know you have dyslexia? Like, so just talk about the challenges that you may face in the workplace. Yes, in the workplace, it's a really, I think the workplace is a really funny place to be at. You know, there's a lot of boundaries and a lot of awkwardness occurs in the workplace, I like to say. <laughs> but that's why a lot of dyslexics are actually entrepreneurs because mm -hmm. they find their own ways to accommodate themselves when they're doing work and, you know, try, they try to own their own businesses a lot too. But you can, it's yeah. definitely manageable to be a part of a team. But what's important is just to create a dyslexia friendly workplace. Mm -hmm. And there's wow. different things you can do for that. You know, more images in the workplace rather than just writing. Or even when you have a piece of paper, uh, make the paper mm -hmm. thicker when you post it. Because a lot of times it's the paper is transparent where you can see through your letters. And so the mm -hmm. letters can be very jumbled for dyslexics. So there's wow. different ways to accommodate yourself, different ways to communicate your disability to your employers and your colleagues. But it's just it's a big learning curve. Wow. Okay. Cool. Now, cause, now this is this is crazy because we live in a generation where this generation we make a lot of excuses, and I know because when I was younger and I didn't know what, what my purpose was in life, I used to make a lot of excuses. So just talk about because just listen to you, you know how you persevering, you know through dyslexia, you written a book, you like, and, and, I, and you say you're about to graduate college, if I'm not mistaken, right? I'm in my last semester of college right now. Last semester, wow, that's crazy. So you're about to. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, man. Thank I'm almost you. there too. Yeah. So yeah, so just talk about like some of the challenges because you know, I think we live in a generation where we make a lot of excuses. So just talk about just the persevering aspect of it. So talk about the excuses that are could you sorry, can you clarify that? Yeah, just talk about like just you know, just perseverance, like how important that is in life and accomplishing a goal and things like that. Because I look at your life and I can just tell, you know, that you know, you're just persevering through it all, right? So just talk, just talk about that. All right. Well, I think being persistent is key. Mm -hmm. And, if, you know, being persistent means to continue stubbornly. I mm -hmm. think we all need to do that because life is so tough and it's so easy to just say, oh, I didn't finish school because, I don't know, I had this, this family drama or I kept filling the class over and over again. But for me, it's just giving up is not an option. Yeah. Just like if I have to read 10 pages for homework, it would take yeah. the average person maybe 15 minutes. For me, it will take me four hours. And yeah, it, it takes me that long, too, if I want to comprehend. <laughs> oh, there you go. Great. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you told <laughs> But it's just you can't give up because, again, we, we all want the same thing from life. You know, we, we want to be successful. We want to be happy. We want to thrive in our careers. Mm -hmm. But it's not that easy. It's, it's not this life is not this beautiful painted picture. It's going to take a lot of work. And so when I wake up every day, I look at myself in the mirror. I say 10 good things about myself. And this is not to be conceited, but I say, what do I want from life? Why do I love myself? Yeah. You know, who, what should I do for my parents, these people who have raised me? Like, And so I really try to think yeah. about yeah. the people that motivate me, what I want from life. Mm -hmm. There's just no time for excuses. Yeah. That, man, that sounds good. Now talk, because I'm listening to you. Now talk about, like, the attitude aspect, because I'm a firm believer that what you think on the inside is going to determine your actions on the outside. So just talk about how just having an optimistic attitude can, will help you persevere. 
Definitely. Well, I'm a big fan of the Law of Attraction. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Law of Attraction. Mm -hmm. I've, heard, I've heard of it, actually. Oh, we could talk for hours about that. <laughs> <laughs> The whole notion of what you think about, you bring about, when you say you ask for something, you believe it, and then you receive it, yeah. or the whole thing about what you focus on expands. I think that's so true. So if I wake up every day thinking like, wow, so I was sick. You know, I had autoimmune problems. They thought I had lupus. My immune system was shutting down. So that was one thing that was going against me. I also have two learning disabilities, but I did not wake up focusing on that. I focused on all that was right rather than zooming into everything that was wrong because it's just not productive. We have to yeah. really look at what's right because, again, life is already hectic. You're already going to have those people or the ones that we call our haters. So mm -hmm. we have to work with ourselves rather than against ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that, oh my goodness, you just hit the nail right on the coffin <laughs> with that because I preach that a lot on my channel, you know, because on my channel, you know, I talk a lot about how I had an addiction on how I was addicted to weed and marijuana and stuff yeah. and how I persevered and overcame it, you know, just talk about how just having the right attitude every day puts you in a good spirit and it just gives you the extra fuel to persevere. So I'm just glad that I'm not the only person who just, you know, I'm just the only person saying it, you know, because... And when I look at you and just listen, listening to you and how you've written a book, you're just persevering and you're, you're doing it, seriously. Well, thank you. I also, this year I realized, too, we, I feel that a lot of us are delaying our happiness. Mm -hmm. And we think about the best days of our life, or at least these superficial days that society says are the best days, so our wedding day. But what's crazy is we can be as happy now as we will be on our wedding day. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> but why do we wait for that? It just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I think I don't know if people love being miserable. I don't know. <laughs> no. <laughs> but that's crazy. Now talk about um the conclusion of the book. Um, because uh, we talked about you know a little briefly at the beginning and the middle, but talk okay. about how do you end the book? So chapter seven is called half full or half empty. Mm -hmm. And obviously I'm talking about that glass metaphor, the cup is half full or half empty. Yeah. And I say that now that you've been educated on dyslexia, you know mm -hmm. what a learning disability is, you know how it impacts a person's life, you know how it impacted my life, and you have these, these skills that you can really take with you. And so basically I'm saying, now what? What are you going to do about it? And I think that's when reality really sinks in. So we all have an obstacle, not just me, not just a person, you know, that preaches about it, um, just, just not these people that are owning it. Everyone has their own obstacle or their own smart water moment, like I did, yeah. that self-esteem, <laughs> devastating, crushing moment. And so yeah. what are you going to do about it? Are you going to let the cup be half full or half empty? And so I ended on a really positive note and just to encourage the reader that you don't have to be stagnant and sit there and be a victim and feel sorry for yourself, where instead you can just push through it, acknowledge what you have, and ask yourself, what am I going to do about it? Mm -hmm. Now this may be a this may be a real broad question, so don't feel no pressure. But <laughs> like as far as, as far as like you know for dyslexia for dyslexia, what advice would you have for a dyslexic who doesn't know who doesn't have any gifts? Because I, you know I am a firm believer that you know everybody's not born with a gift, everybody's not born to sing, everybody's not born to dance. But I think everybody on this earth has a purpose. So if, a, if, you, if you have a dyslexic who doesn't know what their purpose is, like what advice would you give them to help them hopefully move them towards finding that path or that purpose? What a beautiful question. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, so like you said, like we don't all have these random gifts that just fall in our lap, but I think that's the fun part about it because mm -hmm. I definitely didn't know that I would thrive in public speaking mm -hmm. or that I would write a book or any of this. This was not something that I planned out. It just kind of happened. And so for me, because I felt like, I didn't have a gift. I felt very worthless. I didn't like myself. I hated myself. I said, so what gift am I going to create for myself? And that's when I was in a really hard time. Like I said, I was sick. And I said, so now what? So instead of being in bed and feeling sorry for myself and playing that victim role, I said, let's do this. Let's create something. Because mm -hmm. you really have to feed off of your passion. You really have to just identify what makes you happy. Identify what fires you up when you wake up in the morning. What do you think about? What makes you smile? What do you not like? Let's stay away from that. We just have to give ourselves positive energy. And so I created a gift off of something I care so deeply about. I don't want people struggling with dyslexia, but hey, it's going to happen. So what can mm -hmm. I do to help them? 
And so I try not to make it about me, the dyslexic, because I feel so often the message gets lost when you have yeah. the figure or the celebrity or the person talking about it. Yeah. So that's why also on my Instagram I try to talk about funny topics or topics that are so relatable because I don't think it should be about us. We need to help other people. And I think when you have a passion and have a gift, make sure it helps somebody. It's not all about you. You know what I mean? Yes, yes. And, and I talk about that a lot too. Passion, just finding your passion, you'll be surprised on how that just transform your life. Man. Just waking up every single morning, you know exactly what you want to do. You know exactly how you're going to get it. And then, just, you know, just having that goal and that passion, man. I, I, understand, I understand the feeling. That's something that's good to have. Exactly. It's the best feeling. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> but, um... So talk about the old, the overall message that you want the audience to get out the book, because you know we, we talked, yeah, we talked about it last year. So just talk about just the, yeah, out the book, just the overall message that you want. If somebody, if this is going to be your selling point, like you know, I don't know, but you know, just tell us the overall message you want anybody to get out this book. Okay, so it's three words, and the theme of the book is face, manage, mm -hmm. and embrace. Mm -hmm. Those are the three words. That's why a lot of people come to my book signings or my speeches and go, oh, I'm not dyslexic. I don't want the book. And I said, okay, I can understand that. But it's not just about dyslexia. There's a, a whole bigger message like you're talking about. So we yeah. have to face the obstacle or the adversity or any th that battle we're fighting. We have to face it. So number one, you have to acknowledge it. You can't hide from it. Number mm -hmm. two, you have to manage it because you really can't always overcome something. You know, dyslexia, I can't overcome it. I'm going to have to manage it. Mm -hmm. And you have to embrace it because we have no other option. You're going to have it. And so I think that's really the overall underlying compelling message. Face, manage, and embrace whatever you're going through in life. Mm -hmm. It really is. You know, it really is because you're not going to be able to beat everything. You know, that's life. You know, everything's exactly. not going to go your way. But, you know, I think in the quote says that it's not what you do. It's not your past that defines you. It's what you do now that defines you. So whatever, if you decide to do something good today, just do it. If you have a passion, find out what it is and just do it. It's, it's really that simple. You'd be surprised on how just taking action would just change your life. Yeah, and that's what I want to talk about. That. I want to ask you about that. Ashley. Talk about okay. taking taking action, like because I look at you, you just took action. <laughs> you written a book. You, you started. You you started. You wrote. You written a book. You you motivational speaking. You speaking in different hospitals. You know you're about to graduate college. So just talk about how important it is actually. Getting out there, getting your hands dirty, and taking that. Yeah, I just don't know what we're waiting for. I mean, so many, <laughs> so many times we're like, oh, we'll wait for the opportunity to come, or yeah. you know, I we'll wait for my wish to like to come true. It's like, why? Just go for it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> again, like if I would have said I'm too insecure to write a book, or I'm too scared to give mm -hmm. speeches, I wouldn't do it then. I mean, yeah. we have to just fa we have to acknowledge what we're insecure, what we're afraid about, and just go for it. Mm -hmm. And I think so many times we overcomplicate life and say, I'll wait till the perfect timing. Timing is never going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. never. never. So right. just go for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's that simple. <laughs> and, sometimes I, and sometimes I forget that the time is the time is really never going to be perfect. You know, no. so it's, like you said, it's very important to just go for it and just see what happens. Right. You know, if you don't get the results you're trying to get, try again. Right. You know, so that's very important. Oh, yeah, exactly. So talk about and we talked about this, but just talk about um, just, you know, because I think a lot of us get discouraged because we don't see the results that we're, that we're trying to see. Because I know a lot of people that, you know, they say, hey, Terrell, you make YouTube videos. You know, I want to make YouTube channel. I want to I want to have a channel, too. And I'm saying. I hope you're doing it for the right reasons because, you know, there's going to be times where you get discouraged. There's going to be times where you post a video, you might not get likes, you might not get views just because you're just now starting. So just talk about, you know, just, you know, just doing, doing it for the right reason because you seem like you have a lot of purpose for what you do. Yeah, I think that's a really good thing to bring up. So for mm -hmm. me, I, I work for myself. And yeah. it can be discouraging, like you said, like when you don't get a certain amount of views or likes or immediate results, because so many of us want instant gratification. We want it now. Yeah. We don't yeah. want it five years from now. We want it now. <laughs> yeah. And my book, when you see it, it is so tiny, because so many people that are dyslexic, they already struggle with reading, so I tried to make it as simple as possible. But that book took me two years to write. Yeah. I didn't have any initial wow. feedback. And wow. even with... You know, my, my TV show, it's not like I have people saying like, oh, you know, we want you to get interviewed by Oprah yeah. or like people aren't <laughs> doing that. But I believe in myself 
so much, and mm -hmm. I believe in my message. I yeah. everyone's like, Jenny, you're blowing up my newsfeed on Instagram. I'm like, good. <laughs> That's my intention because I have a message that needs to be heard. Yeah. And so. Even for the show, I say, although I have so much to say, that's why I said yes to the show, I have more to hear. And I think when we take it off of ourselves again, how can we better the community? How can we better society? How can we help people who are dyslexic or people who are managing addictions or anything like that? It's just mm -hmm. we need to do it for other people and not think we are that important. I know that sounds kind of weird, but a lot of times people want the fame. They want the spotlight. It's not about you. It's about the message. Yes. And it really is, and not only do they want, to, they want, they think that it's just gonna happen overnight. Like, and it's not. <laughs> it's at all. not. Like, I don't know, not one person really who has just happened overnight. You know. Exactly. So. I mean, unless you're really lucky, I don't yeah. know. It just, it doesn't. <laughs> that's that, that's funny. Now, um, wow, because in my channel, you know, I talk a lot about you know addictions and stuff. So. Like, we just talk about, you know, like, being discouraged, you know, and things like that. So just talk about, you know, how do you, and we talk about purpose, but, like, what 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 other than, you know, just helping people, is there something else that's driving you, right? Because you're, you, I'm, I'm just listening to you, you're, you seem like a very motiv self-motivated person. <laughs> and, I'm very, and I'm a firm believer that if you don't have any self-motivation in you, it's, you're not going to be able to push yourself, you're not going to be able to be productive every single day. Because motivation, if you look at one motivation video, that motivation may last for an hour or two or maybe even 24 hours or a day. But it's not going to last you know, for a whole week or for the rest of your life. So I believe that you have to have some type of self-motivation. So just talk yeah, about what – Also, yeah. being sustainable, like sustainability yeah. is key. So many people want that quick fix. Yeah. It's just like losing weight. Like, oh, let yeah. me lose 10 pounds in a week. Like it's just not realistic. It's going to come back. And so mm -hmm. for motivation – I think you got to be sustainable with these kinds of things, and yep. I know for myself, you I look at patterns. I look at people who have quote unquote made it, and I don't really say I don't want to. I'm not trying to model the people who are famous or the people who have X amount of money. I'm trying to model who is happy because for me. When I think of the word successful, I don't think about fame. I don't think about having 500 houses. I just think about being happy. And I want to genuinely be happy and encourage others to be happy as well. And so I ask myself, how happy do you want to be? How successful? And again, my definition of successful is different than someone else's. And if I can just remain happy consistently every single day, and of course, you're going to have your bad days. But if I can just be happy and be my definition of successful, then I've made it. Yeah, that's all it is. And, that, and, that, and that's the and that and you hit the nail right on the coffin with that. <laughs> you hit the nail right on the coffin with that. As long as, long as you're happy, because the money you can get all the money. Because I look at a lot of these athletes and stuff. A lot of them lose all their money because they because they're not happy. You know, they have addictions. You know, they're just not happy. So you can get all the money you want, but if you're not happy, if you're not doing something that you love, you know, you're going to be miserable. You're going to live a miserable life regardless of how much money you. Have. So and I that's think very that's, important that's such discussion. a good point because we're taught what it takes to be successful. You know, we're taught to have X amount of kids, to get married, to value higher education, mm -hmm. although those things are great. Mm -hmm. I'm all for education, all yeah. for all that kinds of stuff, but there's that fulfillment piece missing. And if we don't have mm -hmm. it, our purpose, our passion, then what is there to live for? Yeah, what is there to live for? That's the question. <laughs> that's the question <laughs> of the day. <laughs> Now, did you ever like hit a wall to where you was like, uh, I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, I'm just, you know, I just yeah. wanna, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just talk about that because I think a lot of us experience that. Oh yeah, I've hit the wall several times. You know, I hit the wall after the <laughs> smart water incident. I hit the wall probably a week ago when I turned in the paper and I didn't get the grade that I wanted. Like yeah. I, I stay on the wall. You know, like but I have to get off of it. But no, I think yeah. we're all gonna hit it. We're all gonna feel. Am I, what is what I'm doing okay? And so mm -hmm. what I like to do, I journal every single day. Past five mm -hmm. years, I could open up my calendar, and you can ask me what I did on February 24th, 2010. You know, mm -hmm. I, I can let you know what I did. And so what I do is I track what I've done every single day, and I see how I've grown. And I, wow. I get really proud of myself, seeing the progress yeah. that I've made. And I think when we hit that quote-unquote wall, or when we feel very down on ourselves, you have to look at how far you've come. You can't compare yourself 
to your best friend or to your worst enemy. You can't compare yourself to people. It's just, it's not an accurate match. And so for me, yeah, look at your progress. Look how far you've come. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, now talk about because, talk about being productive each and every day. So I'm looking at you, you know, you're doing your show, you're writing a book. You know, it's like you're a very productive person. Yeah. So just talk about how just being productive and being consistent is important to, you know, chasing your dream or your passion, whatever goal that you have. And that's a good question. So Anthony Robbins talks about that progress equals happiness. And I think there's Tony a Robbins. high level of truth to that. Mm -hmm. Because when we're productive, we know we feel really good. You know, we went yes. for a run. <laughs> We, we did well in school or we, we got 40 hours in the work week. Like We feel very happy. And I think mm -hmm. for me, being productive is going through that checklist every single day. And so instead of saying, making that to-do list, I have my to-done list. What did I accomplish today? And I feel really good about myself too because although the tasks seem very intimidating or like a lot of work, you just do it. There's no time for excuses like we initially brought up. And so I agree with him. Progress does equal happiness. And again, we all have our own different definitions of happiness, but who doesn't feel good after a really productive day? Yeah, <laughs> who doesn't? <Yeah. laughs> now talk about haters, because I think a lot of us have haters. You know, You're so like, just talk about, <laughs> talk about haters, you know, what does, do haters discourage you, or how, how does having haters make you feel, because we all have them, and so just talk about that. No, I'm getting so excited, I love this topic. <laughs> So I don't know. I don't understand when – I mean, we all have our haters, like you said. But mm -hmm. it's not like I love my haters. I think I also posted a video about that. Like, I personally don't love the people I hate. I just <laughs> – I don't find that realistic. Yeah. But I do love the haters in a, uh -huh. in a sense because these people once hurt you so bad. They broke you down so much. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the fact – that the universe or God or whoever you believe in has placed these people as props into your life and you're going to be able to see how you can grow. So just two nights ago, I had somebody from the past call me. So wow. leader number one, right? And so the way I reacted, I was very proud of because three years ago, I would have cried after that phone call. I would have got upset maybe or I would have been very um, angry at them. But things change. And so... Yeah. We have to use these people as props and say, how do they make me feel now? Instead of just uh, being intimidated by them. And so I love the notion or the idea of these haters because instead of us looking at them like they're forever going to haunt us, we say, no, I can see you tomorrow. I can run into you. You're not going to scare me. I'm only going to use you as a challenge, but I'm going to use you in a, a way to better myself because I want to react differently when I see you and not get scared anymore. Mm -hmm. and, that, and, and that's the truth, man, because I think a lot of people get, get mad because, you know, people, like, I guess their, you know, their family doesn't believe in them or people are always discouraged, you know, but sometimes you just got to, you know, just shut everybody out and just stay focused, think about the reason on why you're doing what you're doing, think about the bigger picture. I talk about a lot of that, too, and that's the, that self-motivation, just thinking about the bigger picture, what's the reason why you're doing what you're doing? And that well, even people like yourself, Terrell, yeah. like you have such a positive vibe to you. I know when you first sent me a video on Instagram, I was like, yeah. his voice, like you have such <laughs> an encouraging spirit that you don't see very often. So yeah. people could just acknowledge the value of a support network and that support <laughs> system and befriend right. people like yourself, people that genuinely and sincerely want the best for you. We need more of that. So instead of focusing on your haters, focus on the people who want to see you do well, who genuinely care about you, who have this great positive energy that you're giving me right now. Like those are the people <laughs> you need to focus on. Yeah, and that's very important. Now talk talk about the support system. Now, you just said it. Now is it beneficial to have a great support system or is it not beneficial or do you need it? I mean, does it matter if you have one or not? Like talk about that. What what's your thoughts on that? Well, I think a lot of times people say, wow, I don't have enough people that support me, so I give up. You know, I can't pursue this goal of mine, and I didn't always have a support system. But after yeah. going through so many different friendships and building work connections, you learn what kind of people you want in your life versus the kind of people that you don't want in your life. And so yeah. just because if this person at home watching this video does not have a support system, doesn't mean it's the end for you. You start building one. You start seeing what, what kind of people do I want to attract in my life instead of what kind of people I don't want to spend my time or hang around. So support system is very necessary. I personally 
have realized how valuable my time and energy is. And so yeah. I will only give that time or energy to people that I truly want to spend time with. And that's mm -hmm. my support system. So I have three really close friends. And I'm mm -hmm. okay with saying that, where before I maybe had 15, but they weren't all good yeah. for me. Yeah. And so it's, <laughs> it's important to have quality people in your life, people that genuinely want to see you do well and are really uh, cheering you on. Uh, and and, that, and that's very important because, you know, a lot of friends, when you grow up, you, you have friends when you're in high school and they just fade away, you know. You really never know who your true true friends are until you actually go through something or you just grow, grow up to be a certain age and, you know, you basically those ride or die friends. You don't really get too many offers, so I think we need to cherish that. It's true, and it's like, who do you want to call when you have these, this good news? Like, that's your best friend. Yeah. Like, who do you want to share your amazing success with, or who's the person you call crying when you have to vent, you know? Yeah, <laughs> and that's important. Those are the people that's going to be most important, I think, in your life. Exactly. Now, yeah. Now, talk about, um, like, the growth aspect of everything, because my channel I'll talk about life, just getting better and better each and every day as an individual, and also getting better and better you know, working towards your dream or whatever your goal is. So just talk about just, you know, growth in every aspect of your, of your life. I like that word, growth. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a lot to unpack with the term growth because mm -hmm. something I've learned with being dyslexic is that we all go at our own pace. I have a yeah. twin sister and uh -huh. does very well in school. She reads a lot faster than I do and we excel uh -huh. in different things. And I always thought that, we had to be at the exact same pace and we had to get the same grade in order for me to be you know, a good student or a good daughter. I had to do exactly what she did. But we all grow at different paces. We all have different dreams. We all have different challenges, different strengths. And you, I think with growth, it is crucial that we focus solely on ourselves and our inspirations rather than comparing ourselves. That's where we get stuck. That's where we get lost. The second we want to say, why do I not have a life as this person does, or mm -hmm. they're better at me than this. Like, how is that productive? That's not going to get you yeah. anywhere. So you have to really look at your life, you know, look at the big picture and kind of zoom out and say, what do I want from life and how can I get it? How can I grow? And create your own plan. Don't feel pressured to compete with anybody else. Because although competition is fun and it's something that I did in basketball, there's got to get it to a point where you say, let's put that aside and just mm -hmm. work on myself. Let's do my own work. Mm-hmm. And, and that that is that is very important. <laughs> you hit the nail on the coffin again. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> now talk about um, like just what is your like? I, I'm sure because you like you said that you document everything. You know every single thing you do every day. So just talk about what do you do every single day that just gets you in the mode, gets you in the juice, or if you're perfect, or if you're preparing for like a speaking engagement because you say you do a lot of so you speak a lot. So just talk about what gets you in that zone, what gets you motivated each and every day. Okay, so what my day looks like essentially is I wake up around seven o'clock maybe, uh -huh. and every single day I go to yoga class. Uh -huh. I love my yoga. I need it. <laughs> Whether I meditate, get some body movement, like I have to move around and just really wake myself up. So I go to yoga, then I'll go to the gym, so I get my workout, my exercise in, because I'm, mm -hmm. you know, loving myself, showing myself care, honoring my body, things like that. Mm -hmm. And so I do that, and then I also, I work on booking speeches, I work mm -hmm. on my TV show, I work on writing my second book, and so I plug in, I make sure I take eight hours a day doing my work, especially because when you yeah. basically work for yourself, you have to be very self-disciplined. You can't just, no one's going to call you and say, oh, make sure you do this. Like, you have to yes. be on for self. Yes. And so really? I do my eight hours of work and get my social life in so I can kind of even out and be a little sane for the day and mm -hmm. drink my tea. And I, I live pretty simple, to be honest. Give me a cup of tea every day. I'll be pretty happy. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you said something very, very important. Talk about the, the self-discipline a little more because, you know, I'm sure you're trying to – are you trying to be an entrepreneur? Yes. Yeah, me too. So just talk about – yeah, you talked about it briefly, but the self-discipline, you know, just, you know, knowing when to work and when not to work. Like me like me too. Like I have a 
daily routine. I wake up. It is funny because I wake up every morning like around six or seven too. I wake up at that time. You know, I wake up. You know, I read. You know, I do a little exercise just to get my mind right. You know, and all good day. Roots, Terrell. We do the yeah. same. We do the same life. <laughs> and, and I see that. That's why I'm so happy because I've never met. I never do. I don't know if this is destiny and I don't know. <laughs> but you know, so just you know, I I'm going through the same thing. You know, just you know. I just find different ways to just keep me in my zone, right? You know, so just you know, just and you talked about that, but like, like I said, the same thing with me, you know. All day, every day, 24 hours, I'm thinking of this, like just you know, oh, can I think of a new content? Or I'm working on a speech, or I post videos every single Tuesday. Like it's just a constant, constant, constant grind. A lot of people think I'm crazy and, <laughs> and stuff like that, but it's it's a real constant grind. I just I try and preach that on my channel, and hopefully, you know, people realize that how much of a grind it is. Because I look at, the, I look at Tony Robbins, I look at Eric Thomas. Tony Robbins was speaking when he was like around 19, and how old is he right now? Is he what, like, he's in his 50s, 40s? I'm bad at ages, but he's not 19. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So you know, I look at all these people, and, and a lot of things that they preach that it takes time to get whatever your dream is. Like it's a, it's a journey. So just talk about the journey. Is the can you know? And we talked about it being discouraging, but what's the journey for like for you? Is it always good? Is it always bad? Or is it a mix of both? Or what? Yeah. So the journey, it is. You know, it's not easy. But I think mm -hmm. if you feel good at the end of the day, or with when you are doing that constant grind, if you feel good, you're doing something right. Yeah. And I think the second that somebody gives you that toxic feeling, that you need to step away from. Yes. <laughs> There's a lot of people in the world, and we're going to be socializing on a daily basis, but we have to be around that positive energy, like we said. But I, I do think, for me, living a balanced lifestyle, when it comes to being disciplined, so I color code my calendar. For example, yeah. my social life is purple. My work life is yellow. My, um, my workout, my exercise is orange. I just see so many different colors. I should not mm -hmm. just see all yellow for work. I should not just see working out. I think if you live... That sustainable lifestyle, so if you are an entrepreneur, if you do own your own business, if you do work for yourself and have to work on that discipline, make sure your life is balanced. Don't just be a workaholic, and that can be very difficult, but don't just do your homework. You have to be balanced so it's realistic, just like you. You're not doing a YouTube show every single day. You're doing it Tuesdays, yeah. mm -hmm. and that's more sustainable than saying, I'm going to do it every single day because it's just yeah. not realistic. Yeah, <laughs> and, the, and and it really is. And I've seen people. I don't know if you heard of um Evan Carmichael. Have you heard of him on YouTube? Chat on YouTube? No. But he yeah he's a he you know he motivates entrepreneurs and stuff like that. He's an entrepreneur. Awesome. And, yeah, and he does videos every single day. It's not a talk, but he posts a video every single day. So one video may be just words and music. Not like Monday, he has a motivational Monday. He does like one minute videos. Tuesday, he does and like great. Tech it's Tuesday. realistic yeah. for his life. That's perfect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, you know, it's very important, to, you know, just to find out what you love doing. Because when you find out what you love doing, it comes so easy. Like, it's just very easy. You know, it, it, it's very stress-free. You have live a stress-free life. So, you know, that's the message that I try to provide in my child. It almost so, feels effortless at that point, even though it does take work. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> now, last thing, last thing. Now, talk about... You know, we talked about the overall message, but is there anything that you that you want to say about your book? Is there anything that I left out that you wanted that you wanted me to mention? Because I could I could talk to you forever, but you know, <laughs> you know, like, because you know we we could relate to a lot. But just talk about is there anything that I left out? Yeah, I guess I'll talk a little bit about chapter two. I do talk mm -hmm. about what kind of dyslexic are you, and this is where it also applies to any human being, not just somebody who has learning disability. And I say there's a dynamic dyslexic, there's the driven dyslexic, there's the deprived, and we'll talk about this deprived dyslexic because it could be the deprived person where they feel that they are deprived of life because they don't have X, Y, and Z. And wow. so I think a lot of people are going through life feeling deprived, and that's why their life isn't going as planned or as well as they wish it were to go. And so I talk about how I have fluctuated between these different terms throughout my life, where in grammar school and in high school I felt very deprived. I can still feel deprived to this day. But right now I am being the dynamic dyslexic or the dynamic person because I am honoring my disability. I'm communicating to you about it. I am very proud of it. So 
if we can just diagnose ourselves, am I being deprived today? Am I being dynamic today? What am I being? So the second we can say, how am I acting? We have to take personal responsibility for the way what we're doing. Because a lot of us say, well, I'm dyslexic. I give up. You know, I'm going to suck at school. I'm not going to get a good job. No, you're being deprived. You have to channel your feelings of deprivation into motivation and just really do something about it instead. And so that's why I like those terms because we have to just acknowledge what are we doing? How can we make a difference instead of just blaming the F on our teacher or blaming it on our learning difference? And, and, and that's very important. You, you, you hit that right on the coffin again. Now, last question. Um, talk about, you know, how can – if somebody just doesn't know what to do with their life, they don't know, like, you know, what they what their gift is, what their passion, what would you be your advice to, you know, just help them guide them towards that? I say get the conversation going. I think that it's the best <laughs> time in your life when you don't know what you want to do because so many yeah. people come to me, whether it be uh, coaching clients or at speeches, yeah. saying, I don't have a purpose. You know, I don't have what you have. I'm like, of course you do. Like, we're on the same level. I don't care that I have these titles of author, coach, and speaker. I don't care that I have a show or a book out. That means nothing to me. I think mm -hmm. all you have to do is live your life and say, what's making me smile today? Yeah. Just ask yourself that. And what's making me feel not so, you know, happy? And so once we can identify that smiling component or that thing that makes us happy, say, how can I build on this? What can I do about it? And so we really have to do that. Just like for me, I never thought I would be talking about dyslexia because I didn't even want to admit that I was dyslexic. But it's something that I was just drawn to and that I could not shut up about. In school, they said, Jeannie, you have to give a speech. Pick what you want. Everyone's like, dyslexia again? She's talking about it again? Well, that's because I cared about it. So ask yourself, what do you care for? What are you excited about? And it's a fun journey. You know, try different jobs out, try different internships, talk to different people, network, and see what's really sparking that happiness within you and what's not. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's the truth. You know, fi just find out what makes you happy. You know, finding something that you love doing. You know, uh, you hit the net right on the coffin. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. Like I said, I could talk to you forever <laughs> because we relate to so much, you know, but <laughs> I got I to pull the plug. But, um, Thank you guys. And thank thank Gina Mazzetti. We'll give her wait, does this better? There you go. Like a nice little hand of applause. We're gonna set you we're gonna set you out right. But um like I tell you, Growth Nation, I say this at the end of every video, you know, Gina explained it. It's really all about growth. It's all about getting better and better each and every day and you know, living your true authentic self. Yeah, I told you I watched the show. That was proof that I watched Yay! the show. <laughs> but thank you for being with us and I'll see you soon. We'll keep in touch. Yes, thank you, Terrell. All right, thank you.